Good afternoon. My name is Kalina Berryman, and I'm thankful that you guys chose to spend um, a few minutes with us talking about changing the landscape around how we engage young people with disabilities in after school, pre college, career readiness programs. Uh, right now, the truth is that we are not doing a good job of that in Newark. Um, there are young people that have IEPs, individualized education plans, and 504s that attend, but typically young people that don't require any significant modification or accommodation. Um, virtually in a lot of our pre-college and career readiness spaces, students who would require assistance to participate are not there. And so um, my name is Kalina Berryman. I used to lead the Abbott Leadership Institute, still lead it in some ways. Uh, and we began to enroll young people into our youth media symposium who had autism and needed significant accommodations. Um, each of them had an aide. We would always um, change the curriculum for them, engage them, but most importantly, to their parents and to our program was we created a space that was safe and inclusive and welcoming and a place where no matter what your level of ability was, you were able to find your excellence and your voice in it. And so how do we do that more? Um, and so we decided to explore that through a grant with the state of New Jersey. There was an inclusive healthy communities grant. And we proposed that we would start this organization called the Newark Redefining Access Collaborative, which would work to redefine access because access cannot just mean for children of color or for children who are, you know, who have what we define as diversity in the workplace. We needed to expand that to start to think, to think about access, also meaning that young people who traditionally we might not think are college bound or young people who don't traditionally attend programs that are outside of the school are sought after and welcomed and encouraged to come in. And that requires a lot of change. That requires a change in funding because they require supports to participate. It requires a change in um, leaders like Dan Denos, who runs a, an amazing college and career readiness program, but may not have thought about how do I, never did it allow young people with disabilities in, never, none of us did that, but are we really taking the time and making the effort to actually recruit them and create the accommodations that they need? So there are hundreds of us in the city that have to do that and you know, having pre-college program providers present, talking to young people um, like Yana near who is exceptionally vibrant and does participate in programs but understands um, how it could be difficult for students he has a, a disability he'll talk about that but also students with far more hindering disabilities why they wouldn't want to be present talking to parents about why they trust their students to be with ALI for hours and hours during the summer and school year, and how can we make sure that other programs can become trusted spaces, and then also talking to social workers and practitioners who are the ones who make those connections in schools. They run the IEP meetings, they make the transition plan so they can become the champions, but we have to create programs that they can tell young people and families about. So that's how we got here, and we're still a baby mission um, because we are just getting started. We're about a year in and still learning, but um, we're glad that this, this conference has given us the opportunity to raise that conversation so that the next time all of you are in a pre-college or career readiness program, you kind of say, wait a minute, there is no student here that that has a disability that we can see. Um, there were, weren't any students here for Youth Day for this conference that had a disability that we could see. Mm. There wasn't. Not a single wheelchair, not a single student you know, with a, an aid, not a single student with a physical disability that we could see, not a single student with you know, autism that you can see because they are, you know, they exhibit more um, easily identifiable signs. They weren't here. And so any time, any spaces that they're not in because of a norm that we've adopted, we have to challenge. Um, and so we'll introduce our panel, um, and then we're going to have Love Gaylord give a little bit of an overview about inclusion and about this work. I'm gonna ask the panel a few questions, and then um, we're going to talk about some recommendations for how we can begin to move forward. All right, uh, Dan Denos first. Can you introduce yourself? Sure, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, Kalina, thanks for having me. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to be on a panel with uh, three amazing uh, folks. 
Uh, my name is Dan Denos. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Leaders of the 21st Century, uh, whose mission is to develop civic-minded youth leaders and prepare them for the world of work and beyond through leadership and professional development. So we're really looking at, you know, opportunity gap, achievement gap, but more so how to successfully transition from high school to career, to college, to trade school, to military, whatever you decide as a young person, but giving you the, the, the capability of doing so with tailored workshops and training through our uh, presenters, so. And also an alumni of Newark? Yeah, yeah, well I went to, I went to, I went to Newark Boys Choir School, we got in a little oh, bit of trouble, wow. got into a little bit of trouble <laughs> as a kid, uh, relocated, uh, went upstate New York for school, uh, then got my act together, then came back home and, and worked through a variety of different uh, facets uh, in the city of Newark, so. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Awesome. Yanir, introduce yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Yanir King. I'm currently a senior at Donald Payne Tech and also um, poet, advocate, creative, all of those things. Um, I attended Newark Boys Chorus School. Look at that's, that. Yeah, that's funny. My, my brother, my brother. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's hilarious. I see the alumni everywhere. Um, I'm a Newark native, and yeah. Wilhelmina Holder's grandson, uh, yeah. Legacy. <laughs> okay, hi everyone, my name is Love Gaylord. I am from Newark as well. I went to Peshine Avenue School, Science High School, then I went down south to college, and learned all about myself, and then I came back and went to Rutgers. I'm currently a um, child study team social worker with the Newark Public Schools for 17 years. <laughs> and I just turned 50, my birthday was last, <laughs> last week. <laughs> I'm telling everyone, because I'm really grown now. Um, and what brings me here is I'm in partnership with Kalina for many years now with the Abbott Leadership Institute, uh, doing different projects with her as a social worker. But in recent years, we started working on um, social emotional learning workshops for adults, empowering parents around the city of Newark. And now I am so honored and pleased to be a part of this new initiative, Newark Redefining Access Collaborative, because we get to start this conversation in places that had never had the discussion before. I have talked to a guy from Rutgers that came to my school twice already, and he said he started the conversation with his colleagues as well. I'd like to see brochures have the um, handicap access on all brochures. I'd like to see your recruitment tables have the disabilities program brochure on your recruitment table. And, um, and, and that's about it. We'll talk more in a minute, but I'm, I'm very excited. Thank you. So, and, so, and so actually you can um, let Love keep the okay. microphone mm -hmm. because she's going to kind of ground us in what we're talking about, how we're defining disability um, and what this world looks like in Newark because essentially what we hope that this collaborative will be able to do is that we will help the district to understand what it needs to share with parents and families and young people. Um, we need to make sure that as professionals, we know what we need to provide and those who fund our work, that we need additional resources in order to provide accommodations. Um, and we wanna create a city where if there, are, there is a space where there is no young people that have disabilities present, we're asking why? And what can we do better to make sure that that doesn't happen? This mission is personal for me, and a lot of things that I end up involved with are personal because my son has a disability. He's 10, he has cerebral palsy, and he is excluded all of the time mm -hmm. from everything. Yeah, and oh. so even family, they don't invite him to birthday parties Perfect. a lot of time mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they just think that they cannot accommodate him. And so watching him navigate the world, he doesn't know the difference, but I do. And as a parent, I feel that. Mm -hmm. um, and so his school ends up being the only place where he is truly served and seen. And so we're working in his community to create an after school program where he can actually have access to after school programming like any other kid in the city does. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a personal mission, mm -hmm. it's a professional mission, and um, you know, hopefully we're looking forward in a few years we will have made progress. So, Love, if you could round our conversation and then we'll sure. have questions. Well, this is the second time we had this conversation and did this slideshow. If you'd like to see the replay, it is on the Newark CPAC's uh, page, and soon we'll have a YouTube link for this workshop because we had a great time to see it live, and we had guest speakers as well. So we're talking about recruiting and serving students with disabilities. We would do introductions, but we don't have a lot of time for that today. Um, you know, what is a disability? We all know the physical or mental condition that limits a person's movement, senses, or activities. And I if this was live, I would ask you, what do you think about? I remember 
before I was appointed or started working with the child study team, I thought it was Down syndrome. I thought it was mm -hmm. slow. I thought it was, you know, those kind of terms that we don't use anymore, right? But we know that um, it's a spectrum. And this is what we usually think, handicapped, vision impaired, you know. And then what about these, the invisible, the invisible disabilities? There's so much, it's a huge spectrum, and I've learned so much in the 17 years that now I'm, I'm, a, I'm comfortable with not knowing because it's more so much to know, and we must be open-minded. And speaking about after-school programs, there's a situation right now, I had a parent call me. There's um, the Newark, what's the school by, uh, on Lyons Avenue, the disabled school. Okay. RFK. Not, not the, just, the New New regional, regional regional day. Yeah. They have an after school program that's developed, but some kids can't participate. Why? Because there's no nurse. So no one had the foresight to say a nurse is essential to this school's after school program, and it's not a, a hard ask. It makes sense. So I, I um, redirected the parent and gave them some language to bring that up to make sure that it happens. So it's it's happening, and, that, and I'm so glad that parent knew to call. Awesome. Yep. Yep. And so we want to, um, what's important to bring people into understanding what this is all about and having empathy towards it is the history of special education in America. So the little HX, that's my little fancy thing, a little nod to my science background. <laughs> right. Okay, so IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Act in the United States was only passed in 1975. So it's younger than me, you know? So it's less than 50 years ago that the United States said, okay, we'll recognize it, but don't we know how long it takes for a law to take hold with something that people uh, deem to be unsightly, something that we should, something that's taboo. Remember that? It was taboo. Children were sent to asylums, and it was all type of weird things. Uncle Tom was in the, in the attic, and they would feed him and let, let him come downstairs sometimes. they collect his check or things like that. And it was just so just, um, just when they, Ousting people, outcast, it's and so yeah, oh, it absolutely it's is, and we're working towards that. But only in 1975 did the government say we're going to recognize these people, right? And then uh, what they over these 50 years, there are 14 disabling conditions. Disabling conditions are uh, conditions that affect the ability to think and learn, that affect school. It's different from a diagnosis, which is medical. Now sometimes we meet in the middle. And there are a diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnoses that um, follow, flow over into disabling conditions. And so here's a code on special education. I dare not press the button right now because <laughs> I don't want to mess up the presentation. But if you look up the New Jersey code on special education, you can find the 14 disabling conditions to familiarize yourself with what we're talking about. These are the kids who would be coming to your programs. Okay. Uh, the next piece is Crip Camp. Now, Crip Camp goes in line with the IDEA. Please watch it. It's on Netflix. It is a documentary filmed and uh, not acted, but all the, uh, all the people in the documentary are children with disabilities from the 1960s and early 70s. This is one of the first waves of parents who did not oust their children to uh, asylums, and they sent them to this summer camp where they stayed the whole summer. And they had staff that were skilled just for these kids, and I mean every disability, blind, wheelchair-bound, uh, mute, hit deaf, everything. So after a year or so, these kids start seeing each other and being familiar, like I have a friend now. They started talking, and they started understanding the kids who could not speak. And then they started uh, making plans and in a short time, they started going to their state capitol sitting in. And it's all filmed. Their conversations, how they developed, you know, hey, we got a common issue here, going to the, the capitals. And even in those, uh, in the late 60s where this was happening, volunteers who had U-Haul trucks and things would go and care for the kids and change their diapers, brush their teeth, help them out because the ones who couldn't speak or we thought were ineducable, they were in there. And their peers heard them and they, took them. I went like, I, I want to go too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they wanted to come too. So you'll see this, this is an exciting, thrilling um, journey. And that, that, will, that will bring you in. That will bring you in. You got to watch it. Okay. So I get all excited on that. Crip Camp. And then the IEP. So once a child is classified, once the tests are done by the child study team, which is a brilliant creation by whomever did it, I'm so glad to be of benefit to be on the team. Whoever created this one thing is four or five uh, multidisciplinary clinicians who test and then they come together to compare the results and determine the disabled condition. Once that's done, each child gets an individual education plan. Each child. Now, sometimes if you work in a school, oh, they look similar. Well, sometimes they do look similar. But what makes them individualized is when the parent, 
the teachers and a whole team come together and make suggestions. No one should ever come to the IEP meeting to be entertained, saying, well, what's the case manager going to say? Right. You know, because sometimes we're limited. Not everybody's as dynamic as Ms. Love and, you know, <laughs> and find out all the information from every corner of, yeah, right, the resources. Like a lot of people are at their jobs, it's a lot of work to do, and they're doing the best they can. But when you, the team, like you might, like if you get involved, you can go to an IEP meeting, you're part of the team now because you serve a student who has an IEP. Come on, you know, come on down. Anyone, your neighbor, you got a friend, say, I'll come with you to that meeting. Go with your friend to the meeting because oftentimes they're sitting there alone with five or six other high, highly skilled professionals that's using a lot of jargon that they don't understand. We are told to reduce our jargon to make it everyday language, but you know, sometimes that's hard. Mm -hmm. right. it's and like love, if, yeah. And love, I just want to add that, just to, just to kind of paint for you all, if you're not already convinced how this can benefit <laughs> our programs are from this issue, we is that we don't even typically know what students have an IEP in our program because it's not on the application. There's nothing on the, is it on your application? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Does, so you know if your students have it, an IEP. It doesn't IEP. say IEP, but we ask if there's any disabilities that we need to know. Of. Wonderful, right? Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's on the enrollment packet, not the application, but the enrollment packet itself. So right, but then that's the, that's the challenge, right? Because it it's be on not the on the application, because it might under it might explain why a student has a You're challenge right. when they show up to your interview, right? Mm. But we don't know mm -hmm. because we weren't. And it's not that we don't care. We we just weren't thinking. It's about still it, developing. Right? And so as we've begun to do this work, and we started, we've done a survey. So that grant helped us to fund. We surveyed about two hundred community members, and some of the things that they said was that. Um, as a parent, because I'm the voice for my child, nothing on this application, flyer about the program says that they're welcome. It doesn't say students with disabilities are welcome. It doesn't ask if they have an IEP. Most people never see the IEP. They don't offer to become part of the team. There is no tailoring of that program. But to the pre-college or career readiness programs um, defense in a way, they might not even know what an IEP is or that they can see it. Because in college, even if you're going to college for education, it is not the biggest thing to study. And imagine if you went to college for business. Imagine if you went to college for public health. You're not talking about special education. You had a general education education. And so it's not part of the discussion. And so you, it's not part of your thinking process to think I must include. It's not in the top five of how I plan a program. Right. It's always an afterthought. Right. So the next one is 504 Rights and Services. So you have the IEP, which is the Individual Education Plan for a child who has a disabled condition. But a 504 says, I don't have a disabled condition, but I do have some situations that require some support. ADHD falls under that if it doesn't uh, negatively affect their academic performance too much, but it makes them their movements, right? When you have a broken arm, you get a temporary 504. If you have a wheelchair, but you are intellectually sound, you might have a 504, things like that. And so we need to let people know that we have services that support young people that have these things. And it's not hard. And love, I'm going to pause us here. Perfect I was going to finish, yeah, yeah, I was going to finish Perfect there, time. inclusion. Okay. Can I just say yes. this one part okay. I want? Yes, so, we're, so that leads us to 1975, we're in 2022, and around 2006 when I first started, inclusion was a big push. We're going to start inclusion. People are like, what is that? You know. So inclusion now in 2022, here we are. They have inclusive, um, inclusive community together, inclusive schools week, December 6th to 10th. Here's the website. You can take a picture. Please go to the website so you can do posters all around wherever you are. And it says, we are here. And now in most schools, there are inclusion programs where they don't have any special ed classrooms. They have those special ed teachers that are pushed into the classrooms now. And that is becoming more popular. And every time we determine what kind of program should this child have, we always consider inclusive practices first across the city of Newark. I know that for sure. So we are in full throttle inclusion. And that's where uh, this is the next conversation. Well, now our kids are in, the, in classes with everyone. They want to go to after school programs. Boom, there you go. <laughs> and, I want, and I want to correct myself as I was going through that enrollment packet. It does not have the 504 or IEP. It has the uh, allergy. So my, my mm. allergies. Well, mm -hmm. but that's, so it's, it's not that's all of our that's yeah, all yeah, of our yeah, applications, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? It's the, it's the allergies that's on it. That's so all of our applications. applications. Yeah. And so that's why you know, even that change you know, monumental. So now we'll convene our panel. Do you all have any questions or thoughts so far before we, I just have a couple of questions for our panel. Any thoughts or questions so far? Well, yeah, I, I do want to add, and this is such an important conversation. 
and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I am a school leader within North Public Schools, and I'm at a new school this year. Something that we did and was intentional, we have um, self-contained programs, because um, some students just need a different environment to excel and be the best. Yeah. However, during physical education, through computer classes, we'll have like a, say, LDS program, sixth grade, and we have a general ed sixth grade, they have classes together. Mm -hmm. And we see this huge paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just getting to the school, let's be clear. Yeah. And because Absolutely. the peers, you don't give them the opportunity to be together yes. in the same space, mm -hmm. they then have these biases. Yes, yes. And it, it, it kind of interpa impacts their social skills. That's their right. socialization. And so that's a huge part of it. And something else, we have an opportunity, and I'm, this is not a plug, we're working for what if I, with what if I dreams. Mm, yes, yes, we're awesome. About ensuring those students that were in the self-contained programs. Awesome. Were in this girl leadership and their obvious disabilities. Come on, let's give a hand clap for that. That's what that that, that is excellent. And awesome. Interesting because initially, because we just had our first session, mm -hmm. and the other students they know because you know unfortunately they say things like they're in that yeah. special class. Yeah. Right. That's true. And you should see them. And they started sitting together, and they were doing their vision board. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, they're yep. engaged, and they're having lunch, they're eating. And then they had this to report out in each group. More students with the obvious disabilities reported out. Absolutely, than the absolutely. Oh, it just the, the space, <laughs> because guess what? Pre-college and career readiness programs and after-school programs and Joyous Program Butterfly Dreams it falls into that category. They are not just programs for people who are going to college or to a career. Like, yes, that's a, that's a product of it. But the purpose of those programs is to develop skill sets and to lift up young people from where they are, to give them access to another way of learning. That's their purpose. We don't require the students that go through our programs to go anywhere specific. Mm -hmm. Our job is to develop them for life after high school. And so what you see is the same impact that that program might have maybe a longer time, take a longer time on a student without a disability. It has the same impact and maybe quicker on a student with the, with the disability because it's their first time getting access to that. So I want to start our panel and let's come back, let's come back together as a panel. <laughs> um, and we're going to start with Yanir if he doesn't mind. And thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing. That is a perfect example. And I have to connect with you to learn more about that because that, it's just, you know, people don't believe that it's possible sometimes. Um, and so Yanir, I'm going to start with you. Um, you can tell us as much as you want us to know about your particular disability, but more importantly, we want to know what has been your experience as a student in, um, in how your school helps you to plan for your future, or even what you notice when it comes to your peers who may have disabilities, you know, more noticeable than yours. Okay, so I'm a senior in high school now, so almost done, thank God. Um, I was, my, my ADHD, I have ADHD, apologies, so I have a tendency to move a lot. I really need to move. If I don't, I feel like I can't process anything. And I have 80, I have 80 minute periods now in school, which is actually a good thing because I only have four classes, it's less to keep track of. But the backhand smack of it is because of ADHD, it's kind of like I need some type of teacher-student cooperation so that I can thrive in a classroom, which I do get. But um, my first experience with, my, with ADHD and the school goes back to, I think that was kindergarten or pre-K. It's a story I tell a lot because it was, it was very shocking, very traumatic, and it was my very first, like, kind of, it, it shaped my perception of how people that learn differently would be treated by people who didn't know how to accommodate for their, you know. So um, when I was in kindergarten, I remember jumping around a lot. And I had ADHD. I don't know if that at that point my level four was noticeable to the person, but it was a teacher that I guess got frustrated over some like length of time. And next thing you know, flash forward, like all of the kind of, some of the memories are kind of foggy, but I was in a bathroom in the dark, but the door closed for like, at least 20 minutes to half hour, to a half hour. So that was like my first, punishment. yes, like real kind of realization of like, oh, people like me, like if you don't know how to teach, 
us, we kind of are subjected to this neglect due to the frustration of the teacher, mm. which I can now, I'm at a point where I understand her perspective and I try to understand perspective and stay within the bias, even if it can seem morally just due to the fact that, you know, a bigger picture helps actually change things. And I noticed that biases kind of just restrict change in a way. So yeah, that was my um, interaction with her. Elementary wasn't that bad, but where I really thrived and excelled was actually middle school. It was North West Korea School. We, I had Ms. Girardi, who I love dearly, and I had Mr. Binger, I had Mr. Muhammad, et cetera, teachers who actually really did treat the school as if it was a community and a family versus it just being said to. It was a small group of kids. So it wasn't that hard to keep track of this person in their home situation or this person and how they are mentally or keep track of, oh, this person has this disability. Everybody was included and everybody was treated the same way and it allowed for what you said like when you you know when you bring people together instead of separating them the union and the pro the progress that can be made behaviorally and also educational educationally right so after that i went on to high school and i have a um, vp that i have a bond with i'm close with because of how i, I vocally express myself and also um just certain things that we clicked on as far as legislation and all of that and because of that, I talked to him. And he told me, he brought to me my awareness of my 504, as though to my mom. So because they advocated for me, my mother and my grandmother, I could walk through high school now with a little bit more leniency as far as I can learn and digest better because I'm aware of my privilege as far as that. So ADHD, having it in school is definitely one of those things where it's like, if you're not aware that you have a 504, if you're not aware of the policies and the changes that are made so that you can thrive, it can be haunting and it can be damning because you can't move and if you do it's kind of like for the teachers who don't know how to take care or teach you they take it as you're being anti or disruptive and that just creates an atmosphere of confusion in which that child no longer feels safe expressing his natural like movements mm -hmm. so that was my experience with it and to, you know, you said bias and how there was a, you knew that there was a bias that you were experiencing because that particular person had a limit on you and mm -hmm. how you should behave in school. And so when she couldn't deal with you, she, she sent you to the, he, she or he, I think you said she. She, it was a she. Sent you to the, like, gave you that punishment. And so from your perspective, how do you think um, bias shows up in schools when it comes to connecting young people with disability to opportunities outside of school? Does it show up? Do you see it? You know, Definitely. Um, I, I like to be very blunt and point out the obvious when it's seen. I feel like a lot of people will take something very obvious and try to dress it up so that it's not really apparent. It's very obvious that kids with disabilities are treated very differently, even if it's something that they have systems that help them. By social standards, it can be a bias that isn't always harmful, I realize. It's just... Um, what you're uneducated on, you're not gonna really comprehend or really act as if you do comprehend it. So, me being somebody with ADHD, I have a friend that has autism and ADHD. A, lot of, some, a good amount of my friends also have ADHD and they've realized it through conversations with me. So, for us, it's, it's like, it's, it really depends on how noticeable it is. Because honestly, mine comes out noticeable when I'm like sitting, but I'm also very well spoken and I have certain things, so it's like, they might not really throw so much of a harsh bias or judgment on me, but somebody that has a disability where it might be extremely restricting or they have mental outbreaks or they can't control themselves sometimes emotionally, those are the disabilities that look at like, oh yeah, I don't know what they're gonna be like. I don't know what they're gonna do. I don't know how they're gonna, you know, and those disabilities, even if they're not intentionally harmful, start to create this cloud of restrictment over that person because that person whether it being, you know, we all have our own thoughts, we all have our own opinions, but what you're uneducated on, you won't comprehend. So if you choose not educate yourself on somebody who might have a little bit more of a severity and you stay in your ignorance, because you have a right to be ignorant, but it's what you allow yourself to still be ignorant on, it, it, that's the bias that those kids face with and walk with every day from people that are in their everyday life, you know? So that's, that's one of the biggest things. Like, bias plays a huge part and opportunity especially if someone feels it's also this idea of someone having a lot of control over you and what they feel you can do and yeah. what you can comprehend even if it's apparent that you can you know it's, it's kind of this it's like a judge judging um victim type of thing where it's like if that person deems you're this or you're that you're guilty you're not 
that's what your life is going to start to shape and become. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and that bias is unintentional often. Um, and it keeps us from doing the work that needs to be done because we just don't know how. And so even when I have my son in the park in his wheelchair, kids, some kids will just stare. And then some kids will cut up and say, what's wrong with him? Why doesn't he walk? And I appreciate that because that's engagement and I can help you to understand him. I can help you to, well, he does a high five though, you know, and then they're fighting over who's gonna make him high five. And so just having that opportunity to be, to be together. Um, I think naturally, you know, as I said before, a lot of times people will say, or even us as, as program providers, we don't always think immediately about that population because we are serving students who we think, from our own bias, are gonna to go to college or career, right? So we kinda of like, it just doesn't come up for us. And so, um, but we also know that there are skills that are developed beyond that. So Dan, can you kinda of share with us what skills and um, capacities are developed through pre-college and career readiness programs beyond just going to a school? Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, awesome job and wonderful presentation. Um, so again, I am the executive director of Leaders of the 21st Century, also the, the founder of the organization. Uh, and I want to be clear that I am um, first generation American, right, just to put things into context uh, with the lens that my perspective is. I'm also an able-bodied person, right? Uh, I'm also a male, right? So there's certain uh, perspectives that I have uh, when the program was developed and designed. I also was a young person who got into a lot of trouble, right? Fights, suspension, detentions, failing student. I struggled in school. Maybe I needed an accommodation. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know, right? Right, but, but I do know is that when I, when I was able to relocate uh, from the environment that I was in, uh, there was a shift. There was a hunger that I had to always strive for excellence in all that I, that I do. So with all of that, that is what leads me to then look at curriculum and design for leaders of the 21st century. So all pre-college programs are technically designed to prepare young people for college. Right. It's, it's designed that way. It's in the name itself, pre-college. However, every organization or every shoe may not fit for everyone. Right, uh, ALI, uh, Abbott Leadership Institute, may be more so for a driven student, mm -hmm. right? Someone who has the desire and hunger to really serve as an advocate for the community, right? right? Versus another program may focus just on law, right? And the focus is we want to get these young people ready for law school. Uh, no matter what the program is, the idea is how do we prepare and develop young people to successfully, again, young people, right? Young people. Although there is a uh, minimum 2.5 GPA to apply for the organization, but the focus is how do we prepare young people to transition successfully from high school to career to beyond to college and so forth and so on. So some of the fundamental things that are supposed to happen, again supposed to happen, are life skills, right, soft skills, and the word that Kalina and I use you know, frequently, power skills. Right? How do you get the right attributes that are needed for you to be successful in life in terms of what success is defined as the individual? Right? Somebody may want to become a professional chef, while somebody may want to become an entrepreneur, or someone may want to become an educator. Right? But what are the underlying skills that are necessary, such as effectively communicating? How do you communicate effectively? Right. How do you understand how to code switch genuinely, authentically, not being phony in front of your peers, but being true to who you are. I'm proud to be from Newark. However, when I'm in a boardroom, I'm going to speak in a way that you understand my jargon, mm -hmm. right? Right? Or, or how do I then prepare my resume in a way where when I hand it to you or eye contact, all these different things that no matter where of the spectrum you may be on, or do you have what is necessary for you then to transition successfully. So, so I want to be, be clear that, that I, I am coming from a, a biased perspective, right? right? I, I am an able-bodied male, first generation, uh, who was fortunate for many opportunities of my peers. But I'm also someone who is well aware from the other undergraduate college that I went to was beginning to think differently. Why are some sidewalks not built where there's ramps? Or why are certain buildings are not adaptive enough for certain populations? Absolutely. You know, why certain buildings don't have elevators right. or ramps? Right, right. 
you know, you know, and, and students who may not or may be visually impaired, you know, how can they then be able to navigate the hallway? So I'm I'm well aware of those things. And I'm also guilty to say that my program is not in place to be able to accommodate. And I, I keep saying accommodate because there's a young lady that I know who's like family who has Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And when you see her, you know, she is, I think, on the spectrum where she was able to get married. Right, right. She was able to go on Oprah. She was able to do all these phenomenal things and speak on behalf of folks with Down syndrome. Uh, but she has Down syndrome, and she would say, "We're taking a dis out of disability." So, so that's the reason why I keep saying accommodation, right. because someone who can be able-bodied may still need accommodation, mm -hmm. uh, but it just may look different than someone who may differently able, differently, different, differently yeah. able, differently able. So, so th those are some of the skills or, or attributes that are are deemed to happen throughout pre-college programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Thank you, Dan. Give it up for Dan, it's great, thank you. And, and what I love about our city, too, is that we are willing to admit that this is a place where we messed up. Like, we missed the ball here. And, it, and we've already, we're constantly changing our programs. Like, sometimes we realize, you know what? We should have been teaching this. Okay, let's add it. And we get the resources to add it. So now, all that, you know, my, and when I initially started this NREC, the goal was just to make people think about it first. They can figure out how to make it happen. We can figure out that we need to have aids if we're gonna, you know, we need to change how we enroll. We need to advertise that we have accommodation. When we do our next grant request, we need to ask for dollars that will allow us to accommodate. Um, we need to let help people to understand that colleges do offer huge accommodations, but you have to go through these particular offices to get them. That has to become a part of our pre-college. How are we pre-college programs, but we never talk about accommodations that colleges provide to our students? We don't even know if they need them. Um, and so before I give it back to Love, Yanir, I just want you to talk about the Youth Media Symposium, which is um, the program that I led for a long time that does provide accommodations for students with disabilities. Um, and what we saw was the same thing that you saw, but what triggered me, Dan, when you were talking about the skills that you developed was that our students interacting with students with disabilities develop those skills just as fast through those interactions than through our curriculum. So they were learning how to communicate differently. They were learning how to work as a team. They were learning how to be responsible for someone else. They were learning how to support another person. Sometimes they didn't want to. They'd be like, do I really have to take it to the, you know, do I really have to do this? Yes, you do. Um, and that's what made when we ask our parents why did they allow their students who are very vulnerable, it's mm. hard as a disabled mom, a child of a disabled mom, it is hard for me to trust my son in the presence of others. What allowed you to trust us with your child who ha needs a, somebody to walk them to the bus, who cannot verbalize, and they said because your kids were good to them. It wasn't, you know, we know y'all are gonna be good to them, but the difference here is that the students yeah. are good to them. And so Yanir, you kind of talked about, um, why, I don't know if you talked about YMS to our panel, but you were a part of the program when we had students with, with disabilities that were present. Can you just kind of share what you observed and then we'll hand it back to love. YMS is like, it was one of those programs that I had no choice to go into because my grandma and ILA, ILA, ooh, ALI is like her baby. So when it was, when, um, she found out that Miss Kalina was doing the program, I was automatically gonna go. So <laughs> when I went to this day, along with my ADHD, one thing that it's, that the curse that I have with it is I have social anxiety and I have bad anxiety. So I'll sh like, I'll, I won't be able, I work on it, but I'm gonna move while I'm talking to you. And I'm going to sometimes need a break from a conversation or to walk out or to just mentally compose myself or I might feel overstimulated through something. So that's been something that even with social interaction has been difficult. At ALI, I was a loud mouth and I talked a lot because of how familiar it felt. Like the people there would treat you as if there was nothing that was apparently wrong with you. And even those who had autism or have ADHD. Or stutter. Or whatever the case may be, you was just seen as, you my friend. So it wasn't really an issue or you wasn't seen by disability, you were seen with them, how you interacted with people. And it provided a much needed and sadly very scarce atmosphere of just acceptance and not seeing people within a bias. Even when you know, there were some biases initially because of the, you know, it's new, 
But once the empathy and all the exercises that we did together came into play, everybody treated everybody as if their own or as if they're best friends. And there's people now even to this day in a similar way of how I've seen, I see Mr. Excuse me, what's your name again? You call me Dan. You call me Mr. Dan. Dan. See Mr. Dan. Brother, Dan. Right. <laughs> Mr. Dan, who is an alumni of the same school I went to, and it's that connection. There's people that I see every day when I'm walking downtown that are YMS graduates that I remember were so enclosed, and we have conversations, and they're a whole new person. So that community aspect that YMS provided and their program provided really does allow people to excel. Not disabled people, but people to excel because at the end of the day, that's all people who have ADHD, autism, or even you know cerebral palsy, are their people. And when you treat a person like a person, you'd be amazed at what they do. But if you treat a person like a lab subject, they're only going to create a very still can in their mind of what they can and cannot do. So YMS was that a, like kind of like a visionary thing of what a civilization or how people can be treated amongst people once they're treated like people instead of as what they're apparently this that has this ability in that was like a kind of like a weird way of me saying it it's kind of a dramatic but it was like a utopia in a way because there was people that if you saw how they were when they walked in and how they were when they walked out it would blow you away mm, absolutely. so that was the why mess was yeah. and in full transparency there was no um there's no, we are now shifting as we're asking everyone else to shift, but there was no um, thing to check off about disability. We didn't advertise that we service young people with disability. What happened was, we've always had students who had IEPs or 504s. Even one of our star, you know, alumni Israel has a disability. And, you know, we, you know, it, it just never mattered, but we didn't advertise it that way. However, the Summer Youth Employment Program um, that of Mayor Baraka's office, they sent one student to us who, who they just couldn't trust anywhere else. They were like, you have the environment, their parent really wants them involved, but they have autism and we need a safe, you know, we need a safe space, so they say something to us. And after that, we became where all the students, you know, um, were sent, and I'm sure other programs took students as well as time went on, but when they first began to do it, they knew that they could trust that the students would have a good, good experience. And so this year, we probably had, under Jennifer Made's leadership, about eight young people who had had some form of a disability that needed um, extra support. It was a bit much, we were overwhelmed staff-wise, we have to continue to work on it, but they had a phenomenal summer and they were included in every single thing. And it was never, the students didn't know who was what or you know the differences. Um, so love, I wanted to come down to you and then we'll kind of probably begin to close out because I think this, this, this is closing soon. Um, so love. Just if you could talk about, um, and then I'm gonna let Dan have the final thought. If you could talk about what needs to be done from your lens, um, because you're right in the middle. Unfortunately, like you said, a lot of people in your role are not as informed as you are about what's out there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what does the system need to do to make sure that access is more equitable for students with disabilities? Mm -hmm. What are some things that we can do for you, colleges, and also that you can do when it comes to talking to parents? Like, what are some of the Well, first thing is partnership, partnership, partnership. We should see the whole city of Newark as a partnership, and that students with disabilities have access to any and everything that's going on in Newark. Mm -hmm. Because of the IDEA, IDEA, the Individual Disability Act, and various other Americans with Disability Act, if, say, for instance, you go to um, Great Adventure, and you want to take your disabled young person, you can call ahead any place and say, I'm bringing my disabled child, I may need some support. They will, they will send you a staff member to walk with you through the experience to give you that help. So we just have to start talking about it more. And I'm just so thrilled to be having these conversations that we usually have behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So without going off topic, I'm gonna to go to my tips because I can talk all day as well. Retention tips. Um, you wanna have informed staff you want to do some staff trainings. You want to send your staff to trainings like this. Uh, this training will be a link. It's on the CPAC, Newark CPAC website now. You can start showing it to your staff or giving it to them for homework so they can be informed because it's important that people know the history. We take them on a nice journey, right? So you're going to have staff who are informed about the population and about the 504, which when you go to the, it's a link. Uh, if you bring us to you, there's a link for that and there's a link for the disabling conditions for you to get familiar with what is this stuff. And so it's still hard to interpret because it's like a whole nother language, right? And then on all your literature, I would support that you would put inclusive language. You can just put the little, you see the little sign uh, emblem 
uh, on the bottom right corner, you can put that on all your brochures. And then the people who need it will say, hey, how do you offer it? What do you do? Unspoken things, because people don't want to be outed because it's still a HIPAA situation, it's a health situation. So we don't want to have an open discussion, but we want to give them a sign that we're here, right? Or you can just say on your literature, offering modifications and accommodations, ask within. On the front of your literature, that a small thing, and like Kalina said on your application, do you have an IEP check off? Please make an appointment to speak to one of our counselors next to the check off. Because they'll check it off and it just it gets checked off. But if, you, if it's a caveat that says, please contact the counselor so we can have a not intimate, a confidential discussion, something like that. And that will open the door to start to service them. And then um, student support awarenesses. You want to make sure that the students un, uh, are aware of what they have. You want to make sure that your student support offices um, are engaging with the pre-college programs and things like that. Maybe there should be some dual trainings. with. Uh, if you're in a college, you have, you have upward bound or trio programs, and then you have the disabilities program. Do they ever get together and train or have breakfast, right? <laughs> no. Nope, nope. And, uh, Proper staffing, I would say include staffing, including a child study team consultant, and not just because I want a child study team, but I say that because we're the glue between the district and the outside programs. We're the ones who write the IEPs. We're the ones who are the keepers of the law. And anyone who really cares about all the law, you know, I mean, we're, we're like really a renegade about um, IEP law and making sure the programs are managed. We, man we not only write them with the team, we manage them all year long. And so that would be your most informed person is the child study team member. Not just me, to wherever you are. You know, you might know a person, ask them to come in. They might like a stipend, but ask them to come in, you know, and assist, and you, it will be priceless to bring that person because they know the whole program. And then you want to say how much um, actively implementing modifications and accommodations. Creating the IEP cheat sheet. Just a one-sheeter, because once you meet administratively and you got your child study team member, you might want to tell the teachers, right? <laughs> so your child study team member can help you with a one-sheeter, a cheat sheet or a binder that you can give to the teachers teaching the classes and they'll have a cheat sheet and they'll know ahead of time what Mark needs, what Sarah needs, right? And then in staffing, when you open the door, how many students can you take? And then the thing is, as IEP law goes, you should take as many that possibly come, but then you have to grow your program. So you'll have to talk to your funders, and you have to look at the law and say, well, I have a sheet that I can show you later. It's a classroom size thing. There is a federal cap on it. And then you would want to bring in a few paraprofessionals. There are plenty of aides, paraprofessionals, who would love a part-time job doing what they do. Yeah, the, hire the aide. They're already in the school. They're already doing the work. I would say hire one now. Because if you think about it, the lower grades, don't they all have paras in the classes, special ed or not? So hire a para for your, your program. It would be so helpful. You hire two or three paras, they can make your copies, they can go give messages between teachers, they can help kids with meltdowns, they can do all type of things. Just one or two paras just because. And um, yeah, the cheat sheet, and those, those are my things. Uh, the, your literature, create, uh, hiring a few paras, and partnering with the child study team. You might have to first talk to the Office of Special Education, the director, you might talk to the superintendent, but your real work is gonna come with working with the actual child study team. Any of the members, the social worker, the learning consultant, the psychologist, the speech and language therapist, they're gonna be your best friend in this. And I would say partnership, partnership, partnership. Thank That's you, it. Love. You're welcome. Yeah, round of applause. Mm -hmm. Thank you, love. Great close out. And so, Dan, I want you to have the final word because the lift really that this NRAC is, is um, the entity that is putting the biggest lift on is our entity. Right. Program provider. Because we're not here. You know, we're fighting just to provide the program we're providing every single day. We have to raise money for it um, and, and figure it out. And so if we're going to gradually begin to do this, and, and part of the NRAC, um, we are offering a learning community for pre-college program providers and career readiness programs, after school programs, so they can even just know what you need. This is, they're not gonna, you know, and we're talking to funders about, we need you to start requiring this of programs. They need to tell you how they're going to accommodate students with disabilities. And we need you to fund them to do it. So we're having those conversations. Um, but what can the ecosystem do to empower programs like yours to take on this lift? Even if just one or two students a year, you know, grow, going forward. Yeah, well, well first of all, um, thank you again for, for having me. You know, I, I would treat this as the student. You know, I, I learned a lot to take back to the Saturday programs that, that we uh, hold for our, our young people. And the tips were very helpful as well. 
as I'm beginning to brainstorm on different ways that we could possibly uh, partner and figure figure things out. Um, you know, saying funding is the easy thing, right. right? Throwing money at something seems like it is the the easy approach, but unpacking it, I think, uh, would be more so exposing our young people earlier with this type of information. Because my role as the executive director is to develop them for the future. And one day, they will be sitting here on this panel replacing us. And they will one day change the laws and one day be the educators in the classrooms or the superintendent and so forth. So one simple, easy thing that can be done is having these conversations within the classrooms with That's the young right. people. Right. You know, our Saturday sessions are from 10 to 2.30. We always bring a highly skilled professional that comes in to expose them to their world of work that they do, whether it is an engineer, or whether it is an entrepreneur, a real estate guru, or a doctor. Well, maybe I need to start bringing Miss Lovin right as a as a as a yeah as a guest presenter That's to right. then begin to start exposing our young people to these terms and understanding when they get in position of power right. and position of authority that they were able to not replicate what we are doing in terms of not doing what's right but be able to recreate something that is right uh, so that's one thing the other thing i think is also uh in terms of communicating on the brochures Right, uh, whether we are not a, a 501, a 504, or IEP, but even the symbols, as Miss Miss Love said, because I believe that not all programs are designed for everyone. I, I I do believe that. I do believe a law program is not for me. I, I took a, a, a constitutional law class in college. It was not for me. I'm not a lawyer, right? And and my program may not be for everyone, right? But the thought of it is that if someone was interested in it, they could, they, they right? Could and and, and if they were bound to a wheelchair, mm -hmm. right? Uh, do we have the space to accommodate them? Right. And, and maybe I may not have the space to accommodate someone who is blind, but maybe I could be able to accommodate someone in a wheelchair and that one person can, can make right. a difference. And I think if organizations begin to think in those ways, yeah. I think we could you know, have a, a larger, broader conversation for future opportunities to come, so. Awesome, thank yeah. you, Dan. And I'll give the final word. Y'all need to give us a charge, and then we'll we'll see if anybody has questions, and then we'll go on about our Saturday. Give What's our final charge? Charge? Yeah, which you, you want us to, on behalf of students mm -hmm. who are sometimes facing bias, why is this important for us to tackle? This is important for us to tackle because when you think of what a well-functioning and well and a sufficient society would be, you think of the people in the community, not the people that are the most benefited because of the fact that they might not have a disability, but the people in total. And the fact that we need to fight so hard for something that should be morally understood and already accepted just shows how much of a fight it is and also shows how much work needs to be done. There's no reason why somebody who is a human being and breathes and looks and comprehends and exists consciously should ever be held against somebody who might not have a wheelchair or who might not have this. There's no reason that. that people should be preaching about equality in spaces where people are not even seen. Okay. That's why this, this, that's our charge. That's our charge. Senior, only a senior. Only a senior. Any questions or comments? All right, thank you guys.